Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Hello, welcome back to the Massive Passive Cash Flow podcast. This is Gary Wilson, your host, and we're glad to see you back. If you haven't already done so, if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. It's on 30 different channels, including all of your favorites, Apple, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, they're all there. And uh, while you're there, by the way, check out the, the new website, which is uh, globalinvestoragent.com. And this is one we created just to show the showcase, to show you all of the real estate agents in the country who are not traditional agents. They are investor agents, and they know how to identify, analyze, and negotiate on and off market deals. They have access. We give them access to every property in the country, every single parcel, residential, commercial. It's amazing the information they have about the people, the debt, everything. So this is one of your best resources, and, and it doesn't cost you a dime. <laughs> so, so go out there and uh, grab yourself one of those guys, read their testimonials, and uh, it'll improve your business. So now uh, back to the podcast. We've got a great, great guest today, Demi Stevens. I've known for pr- at least, I'm guessing, 10 years now, and uh she not only helped me write my first book, she's actually done all seven of them, editing, publishing the whole nine yards and six training programs. And uh, so this is one, guys, you know, definitely turn up the volume. And, and if you can take notes or record notes, do so, because uh, you're not going to get a better endorsement than, than, than this one here. So for me endorsing Demi. So first of all, Demi, thank you for doing this. I know you're I know you're busy. I've worked with you enough to know you're. You're definitely, uh, you're burning the candle at both ends a lot of days. So, th- so we really appreciate you spending your precious time to share your wisdom with us today. It's great to be part of your community and to work with you again, Gary. It's always a pleasure because, uh, well, first and foremost, you remember how to pronounce my name correctly, <laughs> and that wins you big points with me. Oh, yeah. Um, I answer to a lot of the movie stars, uh, you know, Demi Moore and Demi Lovato. So, um, yeah. but I pronounce it Demi. It's from the Greek name Dimitra. She's... Oh, well, I guess um, yeah, she's the goddess of agriculture and fertility. <laughs> I oh, have, cool. uh, Yeah, I have one child and I kill plants, so I'm not really doing <laughs> her much justice, am I? <laughs> oh, I love it. So, so somewhere yeah. a Greek, a Greek goddess is going like this, you know, hold her head. I know, so, she's turning her head, but uh, at yeah. least it's spring, so we're happy for all that she brings. Um, yeah. No, it's a pleasure working with you because you're you're also a productive person and you understand mm-hmm. that people who are busy st- tend to be the ones that um, have the most impact on the world. And, and that's who I love to align myself with. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you so much. So, so for everybody listening, this is going to be a unique subject. Okay. Um, Amy and I are going to talk to about, you know, you know, writing books, creating training programs and so forth in a way that helps you. It, can, it doesn't matter if you're a dentist, an engineer, if you own your own business, you own your own practice and you're in your, or you and, or you're an investor, you should write a book. I'm telling you, and, it, and it's, and it's not that hard. I, when I first wrote my first one, Typical mindset, my gosh, this is going to take months and years, and how am I going to do this and squeeze this in? I got all these other things. And I got a place down on Chesapeake Bay for, for the winter, so I could go out and then when the sun's at the, at the you know, high noon and take the dog for a walk, get out of the water on a paddleboard or a speedboat, come back and finish writing. And I wrote the first book with, with Demi's guidance on how to actually outline it in three hours, okay? And then I got three months left, so I wrote four more books. <laughs> so. <laughs> So just, just know this, you don't have to write War and Peace, you just write about you. It's your story, and people want to hear it. It's more exciting than you think it is. So, so Dima, let, let's go, before we get into details, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, because you're a fascinating person. A lot of people are probably wondering, well, how, how did you end up in this genre? How did you end up doing this? Like, what was your path to get you here, you know? Well, um, it was circuit, circuitous, so cir- <laughs> I could spell the word, but I can't say it. It took me around the bend, let's say. Um, My formal training was in music. So I have a doctoral degree in music performance and history. And I worked uh, as a professor for a while at Ohio State as a TA and Delaware Valley College in Doylestown in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And then um, family life brought me to Glen Rock, Pennsylvania, which is Southern York County, Pennsylvania. We're about 45 minutes north of Baltimore here where um, when people ask me, are we Steeler country or Eagle country? I have to answer Ravens (laughs) because we're closer to the Baltimore market. Um, And here uh, we were not 
close to any major music colleges. And so I wound up um, as the library director at Paul Smith Library in Shrewsbury and came into contact with um, our, our general community service. And one of the things that I brought to my library programs uh, was an interest in lifelong learning. Typically, public libraries serve um, the pre-K crowd, so a lot of uh, story times for families and um, book and me programs with caregivers and toddlers. And uh, so I thought maybe people taller than four feet might also like to learn some things. And so I thought about, I made a list in my mind, all the cool things that I still wanted to learn about in my life. And so things like, you know, how to play Mahjong or learn to brew craft beer or sell my house for more on the real estate market. I could stage it better. What can I do? Last will and testament. I just made this huge list. And one of those items was write a book. It was there on my things I need to do before I die list. And as always, I, uh, when I got to that item, I said, I wonder if anybody in the community would like to come along on this journey with me. And I made a list of the things that I thought would be most important to learn and uh, set it out there to my community members. I thought, well, I don't know. It feels like it might be a big commitment to people. And so I wasn't sure that there'd be many people sign up, but much to my surprise, we actually had to change our meeting space and grow it because 56 people showed up at the organizational meeting. And that was just folks from within a five mile distance of my library. And, uh, I, help, I dangled this carrot for them. I said, hey, folks, you know, we're going to teach you everything along the process. If you just keep showing up and do what I tell you to do, and you have a finished, tangible, marketable product at the end of this year, uh, I'm going to put on the gala to help you launch to the world. And I'll leave you. I just went crazy. I'll even invite a New York Times bestselling author in to headline for us. And that carrot really got people motivated. So uh, at the end of that year, I don't know if you know anything about completion rates uh, of courses out there. It's, a, a, you know, the, the, the proud number is one to 2% if you can get folks to finish. Um, yeah. And I was thrilled. We had 35 authors finish their books and have them published um, in 12 months time. And uh, 25 of them were available on the same day to get together for our gala. Who knew we had to schedule around a Ravens by day. I should have guessed that really <laughs> it should have been in the plan altogether. Uh, yeah. But that brought me to an event where I was surrounded by my colleagues, people who were my age and older, who had finished that to-do item that had been on their lifelong list and had their books. And one of them came up to me afterward. He's about six foot two and I'm just five two. So he put a hand down on either one of my shoulders and said, Demi, I can't wait to tell you my idea for the sequel. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I think we're done. And he says, nope, we've, we've got it all figured out for you. We've got it all mapped out. Um, you're going to start a business where you can keep helping us. And one of his uh, other author friends, who's a graphic artist, he's designed your logo for you already. So we've got you set to go. We just need to teach you <laughs> how, to, how to earn money from this. And yeah. so uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I moved from that library position into becoming a um, founder and editor-in-chief of Year of the Book Press. It doesn't take a year to do a book, much as you know, Gary, um, the procrastination is the hardest part to get through. And indeed, I have learned over the past uh, decade that everybody has a story. You are so right there. And the stories that are the most powerful often involve sharing at some level that could make us vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And other people love that authenticity in our voice. They can tell when we've shifted into sharing something that was hard for us to go through and we survived it. We learned from it. We made our way through and that we're willing to share that with someone else who's still in the journey. They're Mm -hmm. still there stuck in that dark tunnel, trying to find the light on the other side. And you don't know until you're the one to shine your light if you're going to be the person that helps them get through that tunnel. And I, I just, I love sharing that gift with people and bringing the resources to folks just like you so that you can uh, sound your best on paper and come across with the strongest possible message so that you can connect with the people who are out there who really need that message. Yeah. Well, what's amazing is uh, 
when I first thought about writing a book, this was years and years ago, it was before I, I thought of it in terms of business. It was just, I just want to tell my story about my upbringing and, you know, all the, these things that I didn't realize were, were, you know, sometimes extraordinary, incredible until I got much older. I realized, well, not everybody had the same kind of life I had, you know, but when it, when it came down to my business, I realized, you know, it was a genius thing to do. So everybody listening, write this down. If you're, if you're able to write, please do so. You can't write just do a, a recording on your phone. Um, if you're a dentist, for example, most dentists have, you know, marketing material that they're given from their, from their association. I've, I've, you know, I've spoken at some uh, dental association dinners and I, I'd see all that canned material. It's, it's all good. But what's better is you having a book and tell your story leading up to and including how you became a dentist and, and what sets you apart from the crowd. And educate, teach people. When you're, te when you're writing your book, interject in there some, some actual factual things that people can use because now it's relevant. You know, it's relevant to them, personally relevant to them. Because they have heard your story, read your story about how you got to where you are, and you're giving them stuff they can actually use today. And I can tell you this, that book is not going to be thrown away like a pamphlet or brochure will. It's going to sit on their shelf or on their coffee table, right? And if you're really good, you'll have them share it with their friends and neighbors too. It's a great way to drum a business. So that this, this, you can think of a book as a personal endeavor, and you can certainly do that. I, I did that. But in terms of business, if you're in business, this is an excellent marketing tool and a way for you to reach people and serve them. And I promise you, you serve enough people, just like Zig Ziglar says, help enough other people get what they want. In the case of dentistry, which is clean, straight, white teeth, <laughs> <laughs> you'll get plenty of what you want, which is profit for your business. So, so Demi, yeah. I just want to interject that people are sitting there. Now, now they're listening. <laughs> It's absolutely true, though. And, and for business owners, one of the joys a book can accomplish is also address those frequently asked questions that you get. And uh, I, I find it simpler to answer them once with some style and flair and then have that book to pass on because not only does it help answer those questions and save time on your calendar because now the, the 20 minutes that you would have spent with an individual explaining this you can give them the answer uh, from your best state when you're not exhausted at a party or somewhere uh, at your kid's soccer game or something and you're being asked these questions. You can pass them on the book that gives them the answers that they were looking for in a timely fashion for you, but in a way that creates credibility mm -hmm. and authority for yourself in your field. Setting yeah. you apart from every other practitioner in your county or state right there in that moment. You're yeah. the guy who wrote the book on it. You're the woman who wrote the book on it. Yeah, I agree. And it, for the realtors out there, I know we're attracting a lot of real estate agents in the last year. You could let, Let's say you're in Hannibal, Missouri, the, the famous, home of the famous Mark Twain or Samuel Clements, okay? You could easily write something like the history of Hannibal real estate and why it matters to you, you know, and this is your calling for, you, you, you can pick anything you want up, but, but I'm just saying, you know, you can write about anything and you can make it relevant and pertinent to every reader. It feels personal to them. When you put that word you in there, why it's important to you or relevant to you, all of a sudden their antenna goes up. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, Adim, if you would mind, uh, can you think of maybe a couple of recent or maybe not even recent, um, Unique examples, like people, like a dog groomer or a, a <laughs> stamp collector. I mean, I, I've seen all kinds of examples out there that, that sometimes it would just really, you know, demonstrates how, how relevant this can be for you. It doesn't matter what your background or what vocation you're in. It's, it's, it's really just limitless, you know. But, but anybody, yes, yeah, so anything stick out in your mind to be kind of unique and um, interesting? Oh, absolutely. Every day on my job is a, a new endeavor. I've worked recently with um, a broker, a uh, real estate broker, in fact, who has assembled the um, agents on his team to write an anthology. So each of the agents contributes a chapter and uh, it is setting them apart in their marketplace. So um, they're based in Texas and uh, they make the book available to anyone who's looking to buy or sell a home there. 
And they're talking about some of the great tips and tricks that they've used in uh, staging and taking photo uh, shots of the property, how they use the text and words to create a compelling sales message. The, it's storytelling really at its best when you can make it not just about the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, but about the lifestyle that can take place inside that property, if only you, uh, you know, are able to acquire it. Uh, so I've, I've super enjoyed working on that. Um, project. Uh, yeah. One of the heartstrings projects I'm working on right now is uh, with a group that is called Scars to Stars. And um, they're uh, filled with uh, just ev- everyday people who have gone through some pretty nasty times in their life and turned that into a success story for themselves. Um, so, uh, those are a couple of examples. I've also worked with individuals, of course. Uh, the dentist you've been talking about. I yeah. have I have my own dentist uh, book that I was privileged to work with there. And he actually uh, had built a very thriving practice. And his book was about how he did that and how he was able to um, upsell Mm-hmm. various services that oftentimes people will turn down like the fluoride treatment or whatnot, how to frame that for clients in a way that makes them want that, even if it's not included in their insurance coverage mm-hmm. and added to the value of his practice that way. And so he shared that um, with other dentists and created his own membership program based around the content. So the content came first, then we took um, as he made uh, short video clips for each segment of his course. Then we transcribed them Mm -hmm. and I was able to edit them and then put them into a compelling order in the book, making the process super simple for him because he was simply repurposing content he already had. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate both examples. And what's interesting is the eighth book that I'm, that I'm writing is called global, the the global investor agent. And I just, you just maybe gave me a really, really good idea, which is I have agents in over yeah. half of the United States and I could have them all contribute and we could even give them the option of saying, look, I'll, I'll, I'll create it. I'll pay for the development. But if you're, you know, in, 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 in Colorado, we could, or you could create a verse, same version of the book, but that agent would put their picture on there and their name mm-hmm. on there, you know, and I would be a contributor to their book. We were, and we share all the same content. Is that, boy, I, I, I think we're going to present that. I know you're teaching <laughs> class for me today. We're going to, I yeah. think, uh, and then they can go, then they'll see that they can do it themselves and then likely write their own. You know, it opens up a ton of possibilities, yep. and uh, there is something powerful. We talked earlier about how busy people get things done. There's something about um, the muse, the writing muse, visiting people who get things done. And once yep. uh, once that muse sees you being productive and, and writing and putting out your message to the world, she's going to nudge you even further. So I, I think that's a terrific idea of how to get people engaged yeah. at a, a, a quick level that feels less uh, less scary perhaps and and open them up to the possibilities yeah terrific yeah. terrific we'll be right back with the massive passive cash flow podcast after i invite you to monday night live every monday night 7 p.m eastern i teach a class without fail for you on subjects ranging from flipping to buying rentals managing rentals wholesaling commercial creative purchasing techniques analyzing properties identifying properties Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subjects. And if you are a licensee, if you have a real estate license, you should definitely tap in because there are a lot of investor agents also in the class. Many of them are on the, on the uh, global investor agent team. So you can learn from them as well as from me how to actually work with investors correctly and profitably. All right. We'll see you Monday night. The link is in the show notes. Go ahead and register. We'll get right to the, to the Massive Passive Cash Flow Podcast. I appreciate that. So, hey, if you wouldn't mind, is it okay if we share some of the like, like the the what and the how? So, in other people, now people are probably starting to think like I did. Well, what what actually is involved? What where, where are the steps, and how do I start? And and uh, I know you've probably this is probably like this. Okay, Gary, this is where the rubber hits the road for every single person I work with, or some some variation of that. Probably like me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The way you handled it and the way you work with me was was absolutely perfect. It's, I mean, you really knew 
you know, what to say and, and what to show me and gave me that, that belief. Okay. Like, yeah, I'm going to just start now, you know, but uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, share a little bit about that. And if you want to use me as a, as a, as an example, you know, whether, whether it's uh, what to do or what not to do, I'm okay either way, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll laugh no matter what, you know, myself. So, yeah. Well, I think it's super important to start with the goal in mind. Um, so you should begin by imagining what book you want to bring out into the universe and what does it look like? What does it feel like? How, how big is it? Maybe even uh, go browse one of the online bookstores or a physical tangible bookstore or a library, whatever's nearby to you or easy, and look for other books that are similar to what you're thinking about to get some ideas. It'll jumpstart your brain. Um, for me, I like making a, a quick uh, bullet point list of the things that I think ought to be included in my book. So I would sit down and say, okay, you know, there's this scene where I was uh, 10 years old and it was very formative to me. I want to include this. And I would just make it that simple, 10 years old uh, at the beach or whatever. And then the next item in the list and make a quick little list. What I find is that for most of us, once we have an idea what the topic is, the subject matter, and we make this quick list, many times those bullet points wind up being a sort of table of contents. They're almost like a chapter by chapter list for us. And my challenge to you is to do that. I want you to set a timer for two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is super easy. You're going to grab a post-it note, um, the back of an envelope, whatever it is that you have handy or on your computer or make a recording into your cell phone and write down those lists of things you want to include in your book. When the timer goes off, you're done. Okay. Then I want you to look at this list and set a fresh timer for 10 minutes and start writing or speaking so that we can transcribe that. The topic of one item in your list, any one item, and you don't have to start at the beginning. There's nothing that says you have to write the book linearly. What I like to do is pull an item out of my list um, as I sit down to write each day and top of mind. I just put a draft in this. Uh, my writing mentor actually says, excuse me, you have to have a crappy first draft. And your goal is to write a crappy first draft, not to write the New York Times, not to write a, a bestseller straight off the bat. You have to get it out of you first. He actually calls it the vomit pass. He says, you've got to just puke this up onto the page because you'll feel so much better once it's out of you. It's a lot like illness. Uh, and it's very true. Once you get those first words flowing and you're not staring at the blank page anymore, that's the biggest daunting point. Uh, it's easier to make more words flow. And I assign myself the goal and I'll pass it along to you. In this 10 minutes, when the timer's ticking, I'm not allowed to press the backspace key. I'm not allowed to press delete. I just have to keep typing and get new content down. And that's my goal for you today is to break past the procrastination, break past the so-called writer's block, and just get to sharing your message. No one ever has to see your drafts. This mm -hmm. is not going to hit the prime time. Um, I don't want you to compare your writing in this first draft to the New York Times bestsellers because they have their own behind the scenes garbage that they have hidden from you. They're not going to put it out front stage and neither will you. This is for you to get started. And believe me, I have seen <laughs> the backstage clutter of those New York Times bestselling writers. And it looks very much like vomit on the page. So feel comforted by that, <laughs> that we all go through it. It's a universal struggle and uh, just show up and get into the game. Um, that can help you get through your all the way through the first draft. My second piece of advice beyond uh, getting the chapters down and starting to write is that you keep writing. Don't go back and try to edit your first chapter um, and don't go back and try to edit any of these chapters. In fact, this is I know it can be a huge challenge for you, but it will be also what sets you apart because you will finish your book. What I want you to do is keep drafting your vomit past chapters until you get all the way to the words, the end. Mm -hmm. When you feel like you've hit beginning, middle, and end of your vomit pass, that's when you are ready to relax and claim the achievement of being part of the 1% of the world that finished the book that they put on their list. Um, a survey uh, found that 81% of people in the United States want to write a book before they die, and only 1% of them finish those books. Even fewer get published. Uh, so my challenge to you is to be a one percenter this year. Uh, join that club because it's 
closer than you imagine. Mm -hmm. It's within your grasp. So keep writing till the end. And once you get there, the joy of not editing until that point is that uh, when I've worked with authors who came to me and have edited their first chapter Mm -hmm. and re-edited and re-edited to the point where they're moving commas around between, you know, draft seven and draft eight. It's it's sad, really, because um, they haven't finished the draft. They don't know yet how it's going to end. And in so many ways, if you don't know how it's going to end, you don't truly know how to frame the beginning. I liken it to going to the optometrist. <laughs> and um, today, I, I wear glasses and I have a pretty powerful prescription. But let's say I go to the optometrist and I spend buku bucks, and my optometrist should write a book, honestly. Uh, I spend buku bucks on these great glasses, but tomorrow he tells me I need cataract surgery. That's the equivalent of editing my first chapter over and over and over again before I get to the end. I, I should have just waited and had the surgery, then get my prescription tested at the end. So keep yeah. writing and seek out help. You'd be amazed at how um, many people around you are interested and willing to uh, hear drafts of your story, to help you out along the way, and to recommend folks who can work with you and get that to the finish line, um, depending on, on where you are. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, also refer other people if, yeah. if you and I are, aren't the great fit together, but it, you should absolutely consider writing a book because there are people out there who need the lessons you've learned the hard way. Yeah. We well, you know it's interesting is I mean, when I, when I first started writing and uh, you, you know, you, you said, Hey, you're really just do, do an outline for now. You know, what are the, what are the key points you want to get out there? And uh, so I wrote that down. And then when I started writing the actual writing part, what, what was so cool was um, it's like I turn on the faucet just a little bit and then it opened mm-hmm. up and it just came out. I mean, it, I just, like you said, I just went nonstop for three hours. And I, it's yeah, amazing, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. like when the, it's like when your water faucet behind your house freezes over winter mm-hmm. and you turn it on and nothing comes out and nothing comes out and nothing comes out. And then the temperature rises and all of a sudden it's a flood and you just need mm-hmm. to stay in control of the flow. And that's how it is with the words too. Once you get yeah. going, it, it's amazing. And I, and I don't know how I'm not obviously a, 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 a scientist or a medical doctor who specializes in our brains and what our minds, minds function. But I will tell you, if, if you're really listening to this and you're interested, just, just keep this, this is going to help you make you feel a lot better. Somehow or another, the way our minds work, when I would start writing about a particular subject, it's like it's like the layers of an onion coming off and it's revealing more and more. And that reveal keeps going. And you find yourself going down this, this path of one subject that in your mind an hour ago was just maybe a, a sentence 60 seconds long. And here you're writing an entire, you know, half hour, 45 minute chapter on the one subject. And, and if you have your outline, it's easy to go back to the next part of your book. And that's what happens. It's actually, it, you're, you're, you know, it's, if, if you're believe in God, it's like God just takes over. People, writers call it the, the writer's flow. Athletes, when, he, when an athlete gets mm-hmm. into the zone, they call it they're in the zone. I promise you, the zone is there for you and you will get in it. And all you have to do is just pick up your pen, click it and start writing. <laughs> it, this know? practice works very well in real life, uh, day-to-day life as well. Mm-hmm. I actually teach a time management course for writers and uh, for humans, really. Uh, And the same process is at work there where I uh, put a post-it pad in front of someone and a pen, and I tell them to write down all the things that they know they have to do. And each post-it gets its own item. And we stick those post-its up on the wall. And it's amazing that once they get through the items that have been weighing down their their Mm headspace, how free they become to think of the other things that they've wanted to do but couldn't focus on Mm -hmm. because they were too busy reciting that list, the brain being uh, a protector in one sense, trying to hold on to what is absolutely necessary. And once those are out of the way, once you've freed it through writing, uh, the brain shows up then to provide the next tier down of the things that you've been working toward um, but that weren't available to the top of mind, to your conscious mind. It was holding it in the subconscious, waiting for you to still fulfill those dreams that were in there. 
Yeah. Um, and and writing your book is like that. You you clear out that top level, and your miraculous brain and God show up to show you what's next and where to take mm-hmm. it to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Hey, um, if if it's okay, I know we're getting short on time, but I, I want to have people uh, walk away with the idea of like what you know the the practical matters, like what. Um, when you have when you have your draft and it comes to editing and then publishing and there's the you know uh, I think it's EBIN or EIBN number and things like that. How do you what are what are the some of the behind the scene things that people should know um, to, who are pursuing this? You know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So an ISBN number, international serial book number. These are like social security numbers for books, and every book has one and. Most books have more than one because they identify not only the title and author itself, but the format that the book is in. So if your content is an ebook, that'll have one ISBN. The print um, paperback will have an ISBN. The hardcover will have an ISBN. An audiobook would all have their own unique uh, numbers for that. If you live in the United States, there's only one agency that supplies these ISBNs. It's called Bowker, and Bowker charges $125 per ISBN. So you can see that that would add up fairly quickly um, if you have multiple formats for your work, Um, but you can also buy buy them in um, packages of uh, 10 or 100 or so on. Working with a publishing house or a small imprint, uh, uh, usually that publisher will supply ISBNs for you. So that can take a headache uh, away from you uh, because there's filing that goes along with it. Um, However, the two major platforms that I recommend authors consider when putting their books out also offer options for free ISBNs. Um, If you're a Canadian resident, your uh, Canadian ISBNs are free. So do research uh, what's most relevant for the place where you live. Um, But here in the United States, um, the two platforms that I recommend are KDP, which is Kindle Direct Publishing, which is a division of Amazon that will get your um, book and ebook available in the Amazon marketplaces around the globe, Um, but also Ingram Spark and IngramSpark.com will allow you to hit all of the non-Amazon places where your book might be sold. Uh, For some people, one is enough, and um, for others, you want to utilize both platforms um, depending on your marketplace and your goal for your book. If your goal is to have print copies in your waiting room so that your clients can pick one up um, and, and read and take it home, then you can choose whichever one you like, or you could even go with an independent printer just to have copies of your own. Um, So basically, working with an editor is a a process that I think needs to involve some level of trust because you're trusting someone not only with your words, but with your stories. And again, when you've shared the most powerful stories, they're ones that make you vulnerable. And so you want to vet your editor and make sure that they're someone who is going to treat your words with not only professionalism in terms of making you sound the best on paper that you possibly can, but to also treat them compassionately to make sure that they're not changing your voice. Uh, Ultimately, the book doesn't need to sound academic. It needs to sound like you, like you're having a conversation with the reader that is, you know, the comforting mentor that they always wanted to meet. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically, in editing processes, it can it can. There's many variations out there, as there are humans on the planet. Uh, but it can work uh, in one of two ways: either you go line by line through the whole thing, or maybe you have a relationship with your editor that you give them the rough draft content, and then they come back with clean copy, and then you make updates to that. Uh, this is probably the the simplest fashion. If you do have that working relationship with a great editor, uh, that they come back to you with clean copy, you make your additions, corrections, and uh, return them. Then it can go to formatting. I love this part. This is one of my favorite parts to make the book look and feel as rich and powerful as the stories that you've um, created for inside of it. Uh, so you can use other books that are on the market as examples, as a template for how you want it to look on the page, where the headers and footers go, are there design elements, how, how even down to how large the book is in terms of 
its finished dimensions. Um, mm-hmm. Trade paperbacks, for example, are six by nine, whereas mass market paperbacks, you might think of them as the Harlequin romances, are typically five by eight. Uh, so look at other variations in the genre that you want to publish in and move forward that way. Uh, then these two platforms that I mentioned earlier, kdp.amazon.com and ingramspark.com, uh, will walk you through creating an account and uploading your files. Essentially, what you'll need uh, either for you to have created or your team members to have created or a publisher will do this for you is one interior file for all of the guts of the book, everything from the first page to the last inside the book, including title pages, front matter like uh, dedication, acknowledgements, copyright page, and back matter. Like if you're a business owner, you certainly want some sort of call to action in there to invite people to move from the pages of the book itself to connect with you in real life. Um, And then your bio and a headshot, things like that. And then you also need a second file that you'll upload that is the cover of the book. And in this case, it should be the full cover. It will have the, um, from the left to right, it will have the back contents of the book, barcode, the spine of the book, and then the front cover, because this cover wraps around the inside pages, the interior there, Mm -hmm. and becomes the outside uh, flap of the book. Then it's a matter of doing a printed proof copy of the book where you can see what it looks like uh, before release, make any final changes. And I seriously recommend this. If you're thinking you're ready to go from your computer to the printed page, you may want to take a look at these printed proof copies because you've been reading physical books since you were a child and you will apply different set of expectations when you're holding the book in your hand that you did when you read it on the hundredth time on your computer. Uh, So you definitely want to go through this uh, last proofreading step there in the physical book. And then it's time to release and market your book and tell the world. You have to get your message out there uh, because it's most powerful when it connects with that someone who was meant to, who needs that message for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. People, the right people will be attracted to your book. I can, I can promise you that. Um, it, they'll, they'll Google you. They'll look you up and see what your story is and online. And then they'll say, yep, I'm going to, I'm going to read that book. Um, so I, I appreciate going to all those, all those details because I want people to know that um, there are a few steps involved. But it's not, it's, it's probably one of the easier things you can do. If you're running a business, this is going to be easy to, to comprehend and digest and, and put out there. And then, and if you're thinking, like I used to think, okay, well, how can I go from the draft that's coming from my brain to something that people would actually be interested in? And really, you know, a good editor or somebody like, like Demi will help you kind of provide a little structure to it. You know, like there's a, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's a end. Uh, in a way that makes sense. Um, so that that's what I found, and then then you, then you'll you'll get it back, and then you'll figure out okay, I did and reread it by the way, and you realize I need to put in a little more detail here. And Demi used to tell me you know make sure you're you know you're you're get think really think about here. You go back in your memory banks and what what did it look like? What did it smell like? What did it taste like? What did it feel like? You know what did it sound like? Yeah, those visceral details make it yeah. come to life for your reader. Absolutely. How, how did you, how did it make you feel? You know, things like that. I mean, you know, that, that comes in second and it doesn't really take that long. Um, so in any case, uh, I, t- I know Demi, we're probably going a little bit long here, but for, for people who really want to pursue this and everybody listening, I really encourage you to do it. And, you know, I'm sure you can find, you know, other editors and publishers, but I, you know, my opinion is I think you should, you should look up Demi because I've, I mean, 100% rock solid service partner going back over all the years. And, you know, I was introduced to her from uh, Kim Walsh Phillips way back in, I guess it was like 2012. Um, you know, I was learning Facebook from, and, uh, you know, she was one who said, you really need to write a book. And, um, and I said, you know, I've actually started one. I'm just like stuck in the mud. I don't know what to do, where to go. She says, you need to call Demi. Demi is a great unsticker kind of person. <laughs> sure enough, I got unstuck and the rest of the say is history. Here we are seven books later and another one on the way. And I've I actually got, you know, the, the const- constructs for a couple others. But, um, you know, when I, I want to do things strategically so they make sense to the public and make sure they're consumable. So that whole part about, you know, going back and rereading it, taking Demi's advice is it will make it more digestible and consumable for, for people who, and they want to know your story. You're going to help them. Remember, 
your your story right now, if you don't tell it, is only helping you. And you, we have a, an obligation to serve others. And once you start it, you will never get feedback and fulfillment, I promise you, than you will get from, from helping others uh, succeed in their endeavors too. So Actually, um, writing the book is also cathartic for this for yourself mm-hmm. because you remember details that you've pushed past or forgotten. And uh, it, I think it many times, just like teaching a subject, you learn it better once you've tried to teach someone else. And mm-hmm. so through the process of writing this, you also refine your own process. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, hey, Ishidimi, um, or if you don't mind sharing, I'd love for people to be able to, to you know, find you, look you up online, and and uh, if there's anything you can you can share with people, like sometimes some there's little things like a like um, um, the way you start a sentence or or key words you should be using, things like that. If you don't mind sharing. We can put Absolutely. it on the show notes for everybody. Yeah. So Okay. Uh, you can find me. I'm Demi Stevens. That's D-E-M-I, Demi, and Stevens with a V. Uh, my company is Year of the Book Press, and you can locate it on the web at yotbpress.com. And my email is Demi, D-E-M-I, at yotbpress.com. And if you want to email me, I'm happy to reply to you with a quick uh, handout. It's called, uh, oh, let me just snag that. Uh okay. How to avoid throwaway words. Um, it's uh, redundant phrases and words that add no impact to your sentences. It's a great cheat sheet there and words and phrases to use spar- sparingly or uh, even redundant phrases, things you don't realize you're saying in, in print, like stand up. Well, stand already implies up and sit down already implies down. Um, so it would be a quick way for us to get connected yeah. anyway. Send me a quick email and I'll be happy to reply to that with you, uh, with the handout for you and answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Well, Demi, th- thank you once again. And uh, everybody listen, this is kind of unique because I, I teach a Monday night class every Monday night, Monday night live, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Demi's actually teaching all, all my agents tonight. We've got agents in half the, more than half of the states and a couple of different foreign countries. So I'm really looking forward to it. So I get to see you twi- twice in the same day, Demi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. the lucky one. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you for being here and everybody listening. Thank you for participating. Uh, if you could do, uh, well, do, do me a favor and Demi too. Um, reviews are the currency of podcasts. You know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. You, you get the, Hear the final version, but there's a lot of that. The other 90% you don't see. The way that make that makes that go right is if you leave a leave a review. So if you if when you're done listening, if you could leave a review for Demi's interview on his podcast, that would be awesome. We really appreciate it. And uh, remember to get yourself one of those those, those uh, coveted and trained investor agents off the globalinvestoragent.com website. And if you are an agent yourself, you should definitely check it out. And then, then read all about it and make, 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 make this part of your real estate broker's model. You, you, it's, you, you know, when the economy changes and you've got both sides of the house that you're serving, you're never going to run a business. Okay. So in any case, uh, you guys take care. We will see you on the next podcast. In the meantime, uh, take care. God bless. And have a wonderful, beautiful day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cash Flow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.